Hi, my name is Dana Jorgensen and this is my restoration project. Today we're going to be talking about the different First Vision accounts and this can be found in Unit 2. The 1832 account was the earliest account of the First Vision and the only account written in Joseph's own hand. And this one really focuses on the consciousness of his own sins and Jesus Christ's atonement and the personal redemption that was offered to him. Um, but it also can like contains the Lord and Jesus Christ appearing to him in the garden when he prayed. The 1835 account, Joseph Smith recounted the first vision to Robert Matthews, and this was the retelling that was recorded by his scribe. This version emphasizes his attempt to discover which church was right, the opposition that he felt as he prayed, and the appearance of one divine personage who was shortly defined shortly followed by another one. And unlike the other accounts, this account also notes the appearance of angels in the vision. The 1838 account is the most commonly used and most widely known because it's canonized in the Pearl of Great Price. Um, and this account focuses on the vision as the beginning of the rise and progress of the church. And similarly to the 1835 account, the central question of this narrative is figuring out which church is right. In the Joseph Smith papers, he says, I often found myself, what is to be done? Who of all these parties are right? And, or are they all wrong together? And if one of them is right, which is it? And how shall I know? And this sentiment of asking a question and feeling the need to pray and ask God, like the, just the sense of confusion is really consistent across all of the accounts, which is why I included this quotation. Um, the 1842 account was written in response to Chicago Democrat editor, John Wentworth's request for information about the Latter-day Saints and their beliefs. And thus this account is intended for those who are unfamiliar with the LDS belief system. Um, and Joseph Smith noted the confusion he experienced and the appearance of two personages in answer to his prayer. Um, in the book, Exploring the First Vision, James V. Allen and John W. Wench um, talk about why it's good that we have these different versions and, why, and how it can be a really powerful tool. Um, it says a study of the combined con accounts presents some fascinating new insights into the experience and personal development of the young prophet. Not only do we discover in each account more details about what happened both before and after he entered the sacred grove, we also gain valuable insight into how these events affected him personally and affected him in his spiritual growth. I love this because it shows us Joseph's humanity. You know what I mean? Um, it brings him down to the level of a man and lets man be man and God be God. Um, and I also like this because it's an interesting perspective because there can be a lot of confusion when you find out that there's different accounts of the first vision that don't exactly perfectly line up, but this is a really good perspective on it being a positive thing. Um, in the book, No Weapon Shall Prosper, Stephen C. Harper says that those who are open to the possibility that Joseph told the truth can discover other meanings from the same facts. And the danger of closed-mindedness is as real for believers as it is for skeptics. Many believers also seem likely to begin with preconceived notions about the accounts rather than with the willingness to learn from them. This is really, really important. As we study the different accounts of the first visions, it's going to be crucial that you approach the situation with an open mind and an open heart, humble before God, um, and willing to ask for help and willing to ask the Holy Ghost for confirmation. Um, Gordon B. Hinckley really, really stresses in this quote, the importance of understanding the first vision. Um, he basically says like, the first vision is so pivotal to, the, the organization of the church, that if we believe in the first vision, then it really, really lends itself to believing other things in the church. And so it's so, just so, so important that we understand all of the different versions and how they interact with each other. Russell M. Nelson um, extends a really, really powerful invitation that I think really pertains to learning about the different versions of the first vision. 
Um, he says, what wisdom do you lack? Follow the example of the prophet Joseph Smith. Find a quiet place, humble yourself before God, pour out your heart to Heavenly Father, and turn to him for answers and for comfort. We don't know all of the answers, which is why it's so, so, so important to, to follow the example of Joseph and ask God for help and for guidance. And throughout all of the, the versions of the first vision, in all of them, Joseph is confused. He has a question. He humbles himself. He prays and receives an answer. So this is a really good example for us. In DNC 117, the Lord himself states that he has called upon his servant, Joseph Smith, and spake unto him from heaven and gave him commandments. Um, similarly, in DNC 76, 22, and 23, it says, um, now I've given after the many testimonies, this is my testimony. He lives. We saw him once on the right hand of God, and we heard the voice bearing record that he is the only begotten of the Father. Across all of the visions, God appears to Joseph in the sacred grove. In summary, it is consistent across all four accounts that Joseph saw two personages, and one of them was God. Um, and that Joseph humbled himself and went to pray. Also, number two, if you have questions or concerns about the first visions, heed President Nelson's invitation to humble ourselves and ask God. We can apply this through asking God if we have any questions at all um, about any sort of gospel topic that we learn. Um, and remembering that Joseph was a human and that Anything that's confusing to us, we can ask God because he has perfect knowledge.